Welcome, I'm Blair, and in this video, I'm going to try to demystify large language models. For the last couple of months now, how large language models work has come up many times in conversations with friends, colleagues, and clients. So I wanted to take the, this opportunity to get all my materials in one place and cover the topic well. Demystifying the subject matter seemed like the best approach because of a situation that stuck out to me last year. It was remarked that one must be a genius to understand how LMs work. That couldn't be further from the truth, and so these materials aim to break down the larger abstract concepts into their basic parts and ignore a lot of the fine detail required in enterprise-scale deployments of the technology. In my view, it's an important technology to understand because we are all going to see more and more transformer used in generative AI applications in the years to come. Here is uh, our plan of attack in this video. We're going to introduce the transformer architecture. We're going to look at language statistics. Then we're going to generate some new Shakespearean text. We're going to look at how ChatGPT was trained. Then we're going to look at two interactive examples, how agents can use tools, and how we can create our own LLM app. Uh, I'll also mention that the code for the demonstrations in this video are linked in the description. There's an extensive readme that accompanies it, and it covers the topics in the video. And uh, despite my hesitation to the contrary, uh, friends have encouraged me to remind viewers to please like and comment uh, because it really does help other people uh, find this content. The starting place is easy enough. The seminal 2017 paper, Attention is All You Need. However, uh, this paper is dense and does little to demystify anything. I didn't really understand the graphic on the right until I coded it myself. So that is how we're gonna treat the subject in this video. To contextualize that technology, I wanted to highlight what came before. I have some experience with recurrent neural networks, and while they have some impressive capabilities, their computational performance can be lagging, especially as they are scaled up in terms of the length of the input sequence and the length of the predicted sequence. This is because updating the model's state at every step in the sequence is computationally burdensome. This token-by-token -token approach of RNNs is replaced in transformers with multi-headed self-attention. Breaking this down into its constituent parts, transformers are a deep learning method that can encode information into a higher dimension represented numerically. The attention mechanism is an important technology because it allows the relationships amongst tokens and the predictive power to be evaluated in one step using matrix multiplication. The word self is included because the predictive power of a specific token alone is also considered. Lastly, uh, multiple attention mechanisms are organized together and act in parallel to specialize during the training process. This gives the transformer their computational efficiency and predictive power. So here we have sort of an interactive toy example of how uh, the attention mechanism works in transformers. This is from sort of notebook. Uh, variables. We have this class here that imports uh, the complete works of Shakespeare and does some processing on the text. It also creates an encoder and decoder. As you can see, it gives us a, a dictionary of over 12,000 uh, words. Um, but the basic idea in any sort of sequence to sequence prediction is you have um, this block size and then you're always trying to predict the block size plus one. Of course, we sort of work in, uh, in sort of the numerical realm with computers and so that's how it looks when it's all encoded. Scaling it up, um, you have sort of these, um, these batches here that you're trying to process. And the shape to recognize here is that triangular shape. And this, is, this sort of leads to the big breakthrough in the, in the attention is all you need paper is that that shape can actually be accomplished by a triangular matrix. And all you're doing here is sort of restricting previous tokens' ability to influence future tokens. There's, a, there's sort of masking the influences of future tokens when you're trying to predict it. And this allows them to sort of tr be trained to recognize the relationships between tokens and their importance. Um, so again, again, recurrent neural networks sort of use this sequence. They're sort of feeding in the block in, in sort of sequences there. Definitely doable. It gives you sort of normal a normal tensor of, uh, of weights, but through matrix multiplication, you get the same answer. Here we have um, our triangular matrix. Here, these are these weights, and so this these sort of weights are what we are using to represent the affinity or the interact interaction strength for each token that we want to use to then predict the future token. 
In practice, uh, we use negative affinity, so we're just sort of modifying the tensor a bit. But again, we're trying to restrict past tokens' ability to influence future tokens. That the softmax sort of just keeps all those weights uh, reasonable, and they all sort of are equal to one per row, uh, equal to one in the row. But you can see um, either which method you choose, they come out to be equal. And this is what and this is what's being sort of trained inside the net is 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 the is the weights that interaction strength that can be used to accurately predict very complex sequences. More specifically, how these relationships are encoded follows the key query value structure. This is important to their operation. Matrices, the matrices seen previously contain the query key pairs, which when multiplied return a value representing its predictive power. Uh, when I'm thinking through the application of a transformer and attention mechanism to a problem, I imagine it saying the following. Query, here's what I'm interested in. Key, here's what I have. Value, if you find anything interesting, here's what I know. Here's what I know about the predictive power of this relationship. The idea of encoding important relationships at any one instance was made clear to me by the following audio transformer project. The predictive value of the connection between notes at any one instance is visualized. So to summarize, RNNs process sequences token by token, and at each step update the state memory to encode patterns at different scales. Transformers with multi-headed atten self-attention work efficiently in parallel to encode sequences in one step with matrix multiplication. I love this part. Language statistics are how to encode knowledge and text. Here is Canada's Library of Parliament. Any one word on its own doesn't contain any knowledge or communicate any information. Chair, table, population. It's a subtle fact of language that ideas are communicated within the relationships amongst words. Having seen how transformers self-attention mechanisms work, I wanted to scale up a bit now to show how the relationships between words are encoded to form a probability distribution of what the next word might be, using the complete works of Shakespeare. So now we have this interactive example about the statistical structure of language. Um, I find it really fascinating that knowledge is contained within the relationships amongst words and how this is expressed in natural language processing is through a probability distribution over uh, all the over the vocabulary. So again, we just sort of bring in the complete words of Shakespeare, uh, do some processing, make an encoder and a decoder. Uh, we will see how these models are trained later, but we're just going to bring in a pre-trained model to be able to understand this final distribution that it's making. And so finally, um, when we start to make um, when we start to make different examples, here we have uh, the first cis first uh, first citizen uh, the. The target word we are trying to predict is uh, people, and here the model just sort of was able to correctly predict that. You can see a very high 52% um, probability that this is the right word, um, mostly because it's a huge vocabulary size. Most vocabulary words have uh, close to zero probability of being chosen in any one instance. Here we have um, uh, Lady Grey. Um, here, the next word is uh, delay. Uh, I cannot brook two, so a bit confusing there. You can see delay is not anywhere in the probability di distribution that was chosen. Here from King Richard, we're looking for uh, gracious being the next word. Uh, here, there's a lot of confusion. There's none that are particularly high. Um, and it does, you can run it a couple times. Loving, uh, unnatural, not getting gracious at all. But these sort of fit, though, um, in general. And let's try the last one here. Um, 
dos think I am so mighty, so unsettled to appoint myself in this vexation. You can see here it was able, it did pick the right word for a 22% chance before sort of tapering off to all the other probabilities in the vocabulary. Taking a further step up in complexity, now it's time to utilize the generative powers of transformers and build a small language model ourselves, the so-called pre-trained model, again using the complete works of Shakespeare. Okay, so now we come to a part where we uh, generate some new Shakespearean text. Instead of doing it word by word, uh, we are going to do it character by character. And this just reduces the computational burden to something that's achievable on a desktop in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, some of the important uh, parameters when you're training these is uh, the block size, and that's the number of characters uh, that you're sort of taking and, and training on at any one time. And that's where you're sort of training on and you're learning the relationships within that block. Some other important uh, numbers here is the embedding dimension. And uh, that's sort of representative of um, how big uh, your uh, the bit the, how big you can sort of expand your knowledge into. Um, and the bigger it is, the more knowledge it can sort of be contained. Um, but there's also a computational burden to that. Same with the number of heads. Those are those attention heads. Uh, you can have four, six, eight, uh, and, and many more. And, and each attention head can kind of sort of specialize over time for different things about your input token. And then the layers is sort of the depth. You can sort of stack these as well. And the deeper they are, the, the, the better it's, uh, the more it gets more knowledge. And it's better able to uh, reason. But there's always a computational load that needs to be balanced. And so I picked a pretty small net here because our, our the, training, the training data set is pretty small. Uh, again, we sort of bring in our complete words of Shakespeare and do some processing on it, get an encoder and a, and a decoder. We have a get batch function and also like a loss estimator. And then we come to the all important attention head. And this is something, a structure that you'll see again and again. You have that query key and value uh, in every attention in every attention head. And again, you can see us just put the, the token through there and then transpose to get uh, the, the weights. And then we sort of, we, we have mass them. So we understand there's, again, there's that sequence there. Um, so we can't, the, the ability of the net to, to use uh, prior tokens and future tokens is, is reduced. Um, but once you have uh, the weights, you can then run it through your value net. And then this, another, another matrix multiplication there where, where those weights are high, it sort of signals uh, to the net that these are the relationships that are important in predicting uh, the next token. Um, next, you have some different classes that, that add sort of to the multi-headed structure and also the depth. And then you come sort of to the uh, model itself. There is a token embedding table so that uh, completely embeds your entire uh, vocabulary. Uh, and there's also a position embedding. And because we sort of lose the position with doing matrix multiplication, but of course it, the position in a sentence is really important to understanding and comprehension language, you're also sort of, um, you're sort of taking, you're embedding the position as well. And it's really uh, simple. You just take that token and its place and you're just sort of adding them together before you run them through all those uh, heads. And it's just the size of the embedding dimension. Um, outcomes, uh, the log is there. That's, that's the actual probability distribution of the vocabulary that's predicting the next step. And then, of course, you have a generating function, and that's how you actually are getting it to uh, write and write the, the new text and do the generation. Uh, just putting in, in the tokens and running through uh, a loop to get different um, probability distributions as the next token. Um, it's actually drawing from a distribution. It's not just picking the one with the highest distribution. It's just drawing from it and sort of adding it to the sequence. I uh, pre-trained uh, some models to sort of show the progression as, these, uh, as the model is trained. You can see here with 150 iterations, uh, you just sort of get a, a gibberish. It's, it's perhaps vaguely play-like. Play um, with 600 iterations, you're getting something that has sort of the structure that's um, a bit English-like. Um, so it's doing better. A thousand, you're actually getting simple words, but they're still sort of interspersed between sort of gibberish. And finally, with about 5,000 in a reiteration that takes about an hour to train. The model itself is about 57 megabytes. 
you finally get something that looks uh, Shakespearean. Structurally, the PyTorch code that other LMs are trained with are not that much different than the generative pre-trained model demonstrated here. The big difference in practice is that very large language models use all sorts of complicated coding tricks to make the training more efficient and convergence during training more consistent. This chart from OpenAI uh, is a good starting place to understand some of the other features that a generative pre-trained pre model needs to make them conversational in a safe and predictable way. Uh, first, there is a phase of supervised learning. This is where the model is trained on mass textural data so that the model learns to demonstrate a desired behavior. Next, there's a human intervention step, which ranks the output from the model. With enough ranked and labeled uh, data, this creates a reward function that can be used in the last step of reinforcement learning. I would describe this as allowing the ranking of good replies to be somewhat automated, which is required at this large scale of application. It should be noted that the fine tuning referred to in step one is also the same method of fine tuning referred to when uh, trying to build in specialized behavior or knowledge into an LLM. Fine tuning for the purposes of specialization is a bit more complex to train, and the results are less predictable than another method I will introduce near the end of this video, which is super easy. I have another analogy to summarize this chart. Um, this represents a city master plan. Uh, this major step in planning during training acts as the blueprint, providing a foundational understanding of language structures, styles, and context before focusing on specific tasks or conversations. Next, there is a period of building on top of the existing city infrastructure. Supervised fine-tuning is akin to constructing new buildings or structures within the established city infrastructure. This step allows for more specificity, which is required by a city, such as the addition of a fire station or residential and commercial buildings. Uh, similar to how new constructions complement and enhance the city, the existing city infrastructure, supervised fine-tuning builds upon the foundational knowledge acquired during generative pre-training. It adds specialized skills or capabilities to the AI model. Much like constructing new buildings within a city framework, expands its functionality while maintaining its core language understanding. Lastly, city services need to be optimized. In a city, uh, municipal services need to adapt over time based on feedback. For instance, uh, if residents report traffic issues in a certain area, authorities might want to adjust the traffic signals or road layout. Other areas might want to be aesthetically enhanced over time. Uh, similarly, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback involves an AI model receiving feedback through interactions with humans, allowing it to improve its responses based on the given feedback. I found LM's ability to use tools to be super interesting when I first discovered it last year. If one can already code, the creative possibilities to improve productivity are endless. Basically, given some assumptions, LM's ability to reason also gives them the ability to use tools. I wish I could show you some of the more complex implementations I've created in industry, but here I've created a toy example to show in principle how it works. In my experience, this can be scaled up to achieve some really complex behaviors and amazing results. So now I want to show just a quick example of how chat agents can use tools. This really blew my mind last year when I, I learned it, and it's been really um, empowering to put in practice more complex change this year. Uh, this is a, just a very much a, a toy example to show a bit of the flavor and a bit of the potential of the technology. It's basically just a stock portfolio agent and you can you can ask it about a stock and the number of stocks and it goes and finds the price and calculates it for you. Uh, the main trick is that this sort of this sort of verbose description that goes along with this tools, it being a large language model, it's really dependent, its reasoning is really dependent on language. And so I actually just let ChatGP write the descriptions for these tools and it worked really well. Uh, this one just goes on the internet and does a uh, Google search. Uh, the next one does um, uh, a calculation of the stocks. Um, using Langchain, like really streamlined to be able to implement uh, this. Um, these prompts are sort of used in the back end to sort of structure the query a bit more, 
see just it's instantiating the chatbot. Um, here you just sort of give it a toolkit, very simple, and finally sort of invoke the agent. It's all very straightforward. In practice, when you're starting to use multiple chains and more complex tools, uh, this gets uh, much more complicated overall. Uh, but you can see just like calling it on a query is, is very normal. Um, I love how you can just sort of see it thinking there. Uh, you could ask the user wants to find out the total value of 156 meta incorporated stocks. I can use the search tool. It's got the last closing price. You can see it there using the method. And then it comes the answer. The last known closing price was 373. It knows that it needs to then use the stock calculator to multiply those two numbers, getting 58,000. And of course, that final answer is in that nice semantic output that we've all gotten used to. We covered fine tuning above, which, though the process is streamlined by several online service providers, still has shortcomings in terms of pre processing the data and consistent results. A simpler approach to give agents access to knowledge they weren't originally trained on is something called retrieval augmented generation. Colloquially, these types of apps are called RAG apps. Here we are shifting from laying chain to Lama index or meta and the tiny Lama model that can be hosted locally. Using the public domain text of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbons, we compare the performance of ChatGPT 4 and Tiny Lama as RAG apps. So now we come to an example of retrieval augmented generation, where we can look at a, a document that, that the model was never trained on or didn't have access or, or, or internal, and you want to give the um, model access to. In this case, we're just using a public domain work of uh, Edward Gibbon's history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and so the class is set up to, to make the uh, vector store here. And you can see it's just we're sort of pointing it at the directory where that work is. And it's sort of loading it in and it's sort of taking these, these sort of chunking it in a very specific way with a bit of overlap and then also vectorizing it to make the searches for relevant information or similar information very quick. Um, the reason it's set up this way is that OpenAI and Tiny Lemma need slightly different vectorization schemes. But uh, all in all, to build that vector database, it takes about four minutes. And so asking the same question to uh, both uh, of the work, uh, can you list the vices and virtues of Rome in a point form list? See, Tiny Llama uh, does have a point form list, but it's a bit, um, uh, some weird gibberish there. Um, and it only has a very small, uh, short list. Whereas uh, OpenAI has a much more uh, full full list that makes a bit more sense. They find things about the day life during the time period in point form. Um, time limit took 34 seconds, but has like this very uh, strange um, sort of fixation on Alexander. Whereas OpenAI has this like very helpful uh, sort of generalized uh, replies. Describe the geographic extent of the Roman Empire at its height in point form. Again, uh, Tiny Lemma took about 25 seconds uh, and sort of still missed the point form format. Uh, whereas OpenAI, again, does a really good job of, um, uh, of comprehending that uh, question and giving a nice general output there. So uh, this is available in the repo for this project. Um, but just to sort of, the, the main two results, remember, are that the Tiny Lemma was slower, even though it is uh, smaller and run locally. And that the time lemma was unfortunately uh, less articulate. And of course, this, the model for ChatGPT before is substantially bigger. In conclusion, we've explored the fundamental concepts of large language models, focusing on how transformers efficiently encode relationships and generate new text. By demystifying these complex systems, I hope you'll gain a deeper understanding of their potential. LMs hold immense potential to revolutionize various fields, and as these technologies continue to evolve, responsible exploration and collaboration will be crucial. I encourage you to learn more, ask questions, and engage in the conversations surrounding LMs. Remember, the possibilities are endless. Thank you very much.